So here we are, part five of our Building Blocks Reimagined. And today we're going to be talking about covenant. Covenant. Covenant is vital for us to grasp and to us to understand. It is vital. It is one of the most important things that we can understand, that we can wrestle with, that we can pray about and say, God, if I don't understand it, give me more understanding. We need to understand covenant because God works through covenant. He works through covenant. Um, those of you that are married in the room will know that um, when you get married, you enter a covenant. You enter a, a binding legal covenant that affirms the relationship that you have as a couple. And when we come to Jesus, we enter into a binding legal covenant with Jesus. So today we're going to kind of think a little bit about what covenant might mean. We're going to just kind of go over um, the story of Abraham, really, just to begin with, just to kind of, in a sense, remind us of what covenant is about. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what it might mean for us today. Okay, I just want to read a few verses actually from Romans chapter 9 before I go into this. Um, this is just was in my head as we were worshipping. This is Paul writing to the church in Rome. Um, but he's writing concerning the salvation of Israel the salvation of the Jews. And this is what he says. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ if that would save them. They are the people of Israel, chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them and he gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshipping him and receiving his wonderful promises. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are their ancestors. And Messiah himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature was concerned. And he is God, the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. So this is Paul writing to the church in Rome and he is reminding the Roman believers that the covenants that God made were with the Jewish people. They started there. And he's reminding the people in Rome that this is what God did. He made these covenants with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He set forth these covenants and they've not been scrapped. They're still in place. So God is reminding them, and I think it's good for us to start there, that the covenant that we have with the Messiah is one of which we've been grafted into and brought into because of God's mercy to the world. And that's where we begin, with covenant. Covenant, like Shabbat, Sabbath, that we talked about last week, is a means of grace. Thank you, Tony. You remembered. It's a means of grace. Covenant is a means of grace. Without covenant, we cannot receive mercy and grace from the Lord. It's as simple as that. Without covenant, we cannot receive it. But because we have been grafted in, we have been implanted into this vine that grows up, which began with the ancestors, began with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. It began with God's covenants with Abraham. Because we have been grafted into that, now we are a part of this, this legal standing, legal relational standing with the Lord that we don't have unless we recognize that we are a part of Messiah and Messiah is a part of us. So covenant is important because it's about oneness. Um, and probably I've spoke on covenant two or three times since I've been here. Um, and what I'm going to share this morning will probably be in some ways, um, it, you'll have perhaps heard some of it, but I felt God was highlighting something else this morning for us. 
So covenant is one of these topics that you can pick up and you kind of think you know it, but then when you reread it, you, know, you, be, you find something else. So we've been talking about hosting the presence of the Lord. We've been talking about uh, identity. We've been talking about family of God on mission. We've been talking about Sabbath. And the whole thing that underpins everything is covenant. This relational connection that we have with, with the Lord, which is legally binding. Do you know today that you who are in Christ have been purchased at a price? You're no longer your own. So when I go to Morrison's and I buy some cheese, blue cheese preferably, quite strong, smelly cheese, when it is on the shelf, it belongs to Mr. Morrison. But when I have put my money down for it, that cheese legally belongs to me. We're like cheeses, sat on the shelf. But when we recognize the cost and the price that Jesus has paid for us and we, we enter into that relationship with the Lord and we go through the waters of baptism and we are baptized in the Holy Spirit and, and God, God begins to show us that we are no longer our own, we have been purchased and we belong to Him. We are bought at a price. So now we enter into a legal, a legal uh, relationship with the Lord because we are now His. We have been bought by Him. The down payment has been given, so therefore I belong to Him. I no longer belong to myself. I belong to Him. And so really, we, really the, the thing that says actually you, it's yourself, look for your own needs, is being crucified with Christ. We have been crucified with Christ. We lay it down. And really a lot of the battle that we have in our own lives is our own selfishness rising up against the will of God. How many have that battle? I do. Yeah, it's okay to admit it. We're selfish people. But that's part of the world that we are, we are born into. And by the way, when you are born into the world and you are living in the world, you legally belong to another master. And it's important today that we recognize who we are covenanted with. We are not covenanted with Satan. We are not covenanted with the world. We are covenanted with the Messiah who made all things. Abraham, right at the beginning of his journey. Do you remember the story where Abraham is, um, is being pursued by the king of Sodom and Abraham brings a tenth of all that he has to this unknown king, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, the king of peace. And Abraham brings him a tenth of all that he has and he enters into a covenant with Melchizedek. You see, that, that offering, that offering of that tithe, that 10%, is saying, I am, I am buying into relationship with you. Later on in that passage, I think it's Genesis 14, later on in that passage, the king of Sodom then comes to him and says, you need to give me 10% of what you have. And Abraham says, no, I will not give you even a strap from my sandal. Because Abraham recognizes whom he is serving. And he recognizes the, the eternal worth of Melchizedek, the king of Salem, against the eternal judgment and death of the king of Sodom. What about in Jerusalem? On that day when Jesus was presented by Pilate before the crowds. And he says to them, he says, who is it that you want to be set free? Barabbas or Jesus, whom is called the Messiah? And there again, the, that, that choice was put before the people again. Who will you covenant with? Will you covenant with the Lord who has served you all these years, who has reminded you of the covenant all these years, who has been faithful to the covenant all these years, or will you choose 
a robber and a criminal who represents Satan. And of course we know what happened. But for those, but for those who receive Messiah, for those who receive him, we are into a new covenant and we have been purchased at a price. So, okay, so, covenant. It's a relationship with a legal status. Actually, covenant means to be cut in blood. To be cut in blood. What's the Lord, what does it say in the word? It says there can be no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. So here we have Abraham, Genesis chapter 15 onwards. There's this, in a sense, a progressive revelation that God builds on as Abraham grows in his covenantal relationship with him. Genesis chapter 15. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram. This is when he's Abram in a vision and said to him, do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. Goes down a bit further on. He says, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. Bit further down, 9 and 10, the Lord says, Then bring me a three year old heifer, a three year old female goat, a three year old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abraham presented all these to him and killed them. Then he cut each animal down the middle and laid them in halves side by side. Okay? It's a bit gross, isn't it? It's a bit of a grim story, that one. Yeah? After the sun went down and darkness fell, Abram saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates River. Okay? So here is the first bit, if you like, this unfolding of this covenant relationship that Abram has with the Lord. There's this cutting in blood. There's this sacrificing of animals. And then the flaming torch and the smoking fire pot is the Lord's presence passing through them and receiving the offering. Receiving the offering. But here at the beginning, he says that I will protect you and reward you. So this idea of covenant is that Abraham and his family are entering into a relational agreement with one who is larger than them. And the benefits of this relationship, it's like one tribe forms a covenantal relationship with another tribe. And there are mutual benefits that take place. If I'm attacked, you will come to my protection. If you're attacked, I will come to your protection. But here, Abram is going to the highest source of protection and reward. And he is going to God and saying, I'm going to enter into relationship with you. And the blessings at this point that God is revealing to him is, is that I'll protect you and I'll reward you. Okay? So we move on a little bit further. By the way, just to stick in there, covenant is a, is a what? It's a means of grace which we receive by what? Faith. What does it say of Abraham? He had faith and it was counted to him as righteousness. Okay. Genesis 17. You didn't realize you were going to be having Bible bingo this morning, did you? Genesis 17. Okay, so God is now beginning to build on this understanding that Abraham has of, of covenant of what, what it means to be in relationship with the Lord. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee you to give you countless 
descendants. So now he's gone from this God who calls him, who he doesn't really know yet, but is offered protection and reward to God Almighty. I am the highest source of power. You're entering into relationship with me. Do you know what you're letting yourself in for? Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. So there's a responsibility now that God is giving into him. If you're going to be in covenant with me, there is a responsibility that you have. God said to Abraham, this is Abraham. So, sorry, he also changes his name at this point in time. Okay? But then at verse 9, it says, God says to Abraham, your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility This is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. So the cutting in blood again. First we have the animals, then we have the circumcision. It's this sign of the covenant. The sign of the covenant. And it's a thing that has to be obeyed. Okay? The responsibility is to obey the covenant. Genesis 18, a son is promised to Sarah. Um, Note, only a covenant partner can talk with a covenant partner in the way that Abraham does with God and the three visitors about Sodom and how he intercedes for them and says, well, if there's 50 righteous people, will you save the city? If there are 25, you can only do that if you have a covenant relationship with someone. You can't bargain with God if you're not in covenant with him. So, hallelujah. So Abraham discusses with his covenant partner and says, what about it? Okay. And then we get to Genesis 21 and 22 and A son is born, the promised son Isaac is born and then Abraham of course is tested and says take your son and I want you to offer him to me as a sacrifice. Where's your allegiance? Again that question, where is your allegiance? Whom are you covenanted with? Do you still trust me as your covenant partner even though the one whom is promised is about to be offered as a sacrifice. Who are you covenanted to? And so there's a whole story. Abraham lays his Isaac on the altar and just as he's about to put the knife in, the the angel stops him and says, whoa, 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 whoa. I believe you. God himself will provide the ram and the ram is caught in the thicket and the ram goes in Isaac's place. And the covenant is finally sealed between God and Abraham. The covenant is finally fully sealed. And and of course, along with that, there's the whole prophetic journey that comes from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Moses to Israel to David, right on down until the Messiah comes. And we see the fullness of of that prophetic journey in the Messiah. So what we see in Abraham's life is a journey of oneness. Because covenant is about oneness. It is about oneness. When I married Joe, we became one person. We We are individuals. We have our own personality. We have our own interests. Joe likes running and I can't stand it. (laughs) You know, but we are one. We have become one. And we are becoming one more and more as each day passes on. We are becoming one. There is a journey to oneness that is taking place. So when Abraham first was promised, Protection and a great reward. I am El Shaddai. You are going to make a covenant with you to the point in which God provides the ram. 
Abraham has been going on a journey of oneness with the Lord. Over time, our bonds become stronger. The purposes are entwined until there is a complete partnership between God and Abraham. I wonder, uh, you can perhaps, if you think back over your own timeline, walking with God, there are points in which you know God has stepped up that level of covenantal commitment with you. And he's called you to step up that covenantal commitment with him. And the reason he does that is, is so that those bonds of oneness can become stronger. He's developing and deepening that connection that we have with one another. And so the covenant that God offers to us in Yeshua, in Jesus, is what? It's protection, it's blessing, it's descendants. God will bless our descendants. I will pour out my spirit on your children and your blessing upon your grandchildren. Yes? And ultimately, the covenant with Jesus, the Messiah, aligns us with the purposes of God what are happening now. He's aligning us with the purpose and the heart of God now, individually, corporately, and globally. So, John 15. This John 15 to me is one of the most profound examples of the language of covenant that we can read in the scriptures. John 15. I'm just going to read the first five verses. I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Remain covenanted to me. Remain in me. Remain in oneness with me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Wow. Even Jesus says we can do nothing apart from him. So I don't, feel, don't know why we still feel that we can carry on in our own understanding and our own intellect and our own self-will when even Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Why? Because we need to become more and more entwined with the life of Jesus and the life of Jesus in us. We need to become more one. What is it that John the Baptist said? He must increase and I must decrease. In other words, my will and my self-will and my self-purpose must decrease and his will and his purpose must increase. His life in me and my life in him because I have been purchased at a price. Covenant promise, verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will what? It will be granted. So we are in covenant. What you ask of me will be granted because I have bought you at a price and you belong to me. So what also comes? The responsibility. Verse 10. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. So here is the responsibility of a covenantal people is to what? Love one another. Because actually love fulfills the law. Not the world's love. Covenantal love. Chesed. Sticky love. 
Chesed is a sticky kind of love that you cannot shake off. You cannot shake off the love that the Father has given to us in covenant through Jesus. You cannot do it. We can run away. We can try and hide from it. We can try and move away from it. Sometimes I know in my, time, in my life, there have been times when God has asked me to do something and I have ran in the opposite direction. But he's always brought me back round to that thing again. Why? Because I'm stuck to him and he's stuck to me. Chesed, that's a good word for you to remember. After three, can everybody say chesed, chesed. And when you read in the scriptures your unfailing, undying love, that is chesed because it is a covenant that is being given. Anyway, so why does Jesus place an emphasis on loving each other? Why? The answer is in John 17, a couple of verses here. Verse 11, Now I am departing from the world, and they are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. Verse 21, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. So there is a oneness that takes place between me and Jesus, but there is an also a oneness that takes place between me and you. That is why there is such an emphasis upon being you having unity in the Scriptures because unity is a sign of the covenant and we are un united with one another because of the covenant that we share with God. No wonder God places such an emphasis upon unity. There is a unity that takes place between the Father, the Son and the Spirit in relationship with one another and there is a relationship and as we enter into that relationship there is a, a oneness that takes place between me and the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit you, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and us, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit so through Jesus we're not only covenanted to God but we are covenanted as his body to one another wow that's powerful isn't it that's why unity is essential and Jesus asks us for obedience in this area, to love one another. The family of God grows in oneness. It grows in oneness. As we grow in our understanding of covenant, we grow in oneness with each other. Psalm 133, how Lovely it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity. And right at the end of that psalm, he says, because it is there that God bestows his blessing, in unity, not in division. Because we are breaking covenant in division, but in unity, we are maintaining covenant and keeping covenant. Unity doesn't mean uniformity. It doesn't mean that we all do and look like the same but it means that we are called to a higher purpose. And it means that the higher purpose is the thing that we are aiming for together. One purpose, one heart, one mind, hosting the presence of God. That is the covenant that we have, hosting the presence of God. One purpose, one heart, one mind, hosting the presence of God. Let's come in line. Let's align with that more and more in our own lives and together as a body. Let's be aligned in that purpose that we have been given. So the covenant that we have is what? It is cut in blood. And whose blood is it cut in? Jesus' blood. Jesus' blood. The covenants are still there for the Jewish people. We have not, they have not been replaced. They have not been thrown out. It is still there. But the covenant is restored when they enter into the blood of the Messiah. 
of which we share the covenant now, the covenant that was given to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David. None of that has been scrapped. It's still relevant. So we belong to Jesus because we have been cut in his blood. His blood is being cut and spilled so that we now belong to him. The new covenant that we celebrate reflects completely the old that God has had all the time. It has not scrapped it, got rid of it. It is the restoration of it. It is the reminder of it. And that in Jesus is the fulfillment of it. So when we celebrate it in a moment, and Mick's going to lead us in this act of obedience and celebrating the covenant together, the body and blood of Messiah. No wonder Paul places such an emphasis upon unity in 1 Corinthians 11. Have you ever read? We, we read that bit, don't we? For I say of the Lord, I tell you what I've received on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. Therefore, examine yourselves. I used to meet, think that to me and examine myself because I've got to deal with the issues of sin in my life before I can take communion. Communion is a means of grace and mercy. Actually, what Paul's talking about in the context of the passage is division within the body. So if you take it and you are, you know, you have issue with a brother or sister in the body, that is when you are eating it's against the body and you're taking it against the body because you're in division. That's why there has to be unity in the body of Christ. This, above all, reminds us of the chesed, the unbreakable, unshakable covenant that we have with God in Jesus. And actually, as we partake in it, in this means of grace, it is a, a means in which we can become even more united with the Lord, even more in oneness with him and with each other. God bless you.